We've been following Jesus and learning how to follow Jesus. We've been following Jesus in the boat. Now we're going to start following Jesus on the mountains. So would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 4? Following Christ on the mountains. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Matthew chapter 4. In verse 8, again, the devil took him to go to an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. The first mountain that Jesus ever went upon was the Mount of Temptation, the very first mountain that he went on. We're going to learn some things today from Christ. Hebrews 2.18 says it this way. For in that he has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help those that are tempted. And so as we look at his temptation, we learn how to go through temptation. We learn how to go through the mountain of temptation. The devil took him to go on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, all these things I'll give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now we're going to learn a whole lot about Temptation, but we're going to learn a whole lot more important things than the temptation. Long time ago, another life, I was an explorer scout, and we went up into Canada, into the mountains in the lake area, and canoed around up there for two weeks, and we lived off the land. Boy, that was an experience for a land lover on flat land. And we had this guide. He was a very good guide, and he was a younger fellow. And that's what he did was take these older scouts on these trailblazing events, and we were up there for two weeks. Well, man, it was exciting. I was standing in the canoe one day, and fishing. I was standing in the canoe now, standing in the canoe. And I was fishing, and we were catching these great big pike. That, that's what's up there. And I reeled my lure in, and it came clear to the top of my pole and all of a sudden this three foot pike jumps out of the water straight up into the air and grabs my lure and goes back in he went one way I went the other I grabbed myself and saved myself from falling out of the boat that's what we ate that night it was marvelous and then that's what we ate the next morning I said what are we having the next morning he said fish I said what are we having for lunch he said fish all, all of us were catching fish. We were eating fish. And said, Did you bring anything but fish? He said, no, we're living off the land. There's the berries right over there if you'd like some. And there really were berries, and that kind of helped the taste of the fish. But while we were up there, our guide got lost. And we paddled up to this one portage, and we just stopped, and we sat there for about an hour and a half. We said, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to figure out where we are. That's never good. <laughs> when your guide is lost. And finally he said, well, I can't figure it out, but I know another way home. That's good. And so we went a different way. And it took us so long that when we got back to the main base, they were already sending people out to go look for us because we were so late. But he did know another way home, and we did get home. But the whole point of that story is you better be with the right guide. Jesus is our guide, and if you want to follow him, you will never get lost. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. And this is what we're going to learn today. Point number one, we got, we've got got to keep our eyes on God. No matter what happened with Jesus, he always had his eyes on God. We've got to keep our eyes on Christ. As he walks through this, we're going to walk through this with him. As we follow him, we're going to follow him wherever he goes. But point number one, no matter what happens, we must keep our eyes on on Jesus, on him, him 
I guess point number one could be what's important. Him. Him. He's what's important. We must keep our eyes on Him. We must keep our eyes on God, the Son. Read with me. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. But Jesus had his eyes on the Father. What's he doing? Fasting 40 days and 40 nights? He's praying, talking to the, the Father. Who's leading him? Verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit. This is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right here. We've got to keep our eyes on God. This is the point one. This is also the sermon. This is also the theme of the sermon. This is also the illustration of the sermon. We must keep our eyes on God. We've got to keep our ears open to God. We must know where he is at all times. He never get. we get lost. He never gets lost. We're sheep. We get lost, we get stuck, we get hung up all the time. He never does. We've got to keep our eyes on God because there's an enemy out there and there's a whole big world out there and he took him up to the tallest mountain in the world and showed him all the kings of the world and showed him all the riches of the world and showed him all the power of the world and showed him everything. And if you don't think that'll take your eyes off God. So we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Now let's take a look at this passage right quick. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, into the wilderness. Now right there you could put a colon or a semicolon. Because in the Greek text, the next passage is not a verb. King James translates to this, he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. No. If, if we read in another passage, we're going to see it just a little bit different, but No. Verse 2, what's he doing in verse 2? He was led up by the Spirit to spend time with God in the wilderness. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to, be fa to fast and pray for how many days? Okay, now I want you to go back with me to verse 1. This is going to be important in interpreting this passage. To be tempted by the devil is a good translation but they need to put it someplace else. And it's hard to, but to be tempted, to be tempted is an infinitive. It's not the verb. It's not a verb. It's an infinitive. And here's the picture that the Greek language is showing. This is important. The Holy Spirit is going to lead Jesus into the wilderness to fast and pray for how many days? Okay, and then I want you to put a slash right there to be tempted by the devil because this is the other side of the coin. This isn't part of the verb. He's not being led into the wilderness to be tempted. He's being led into the wilderness to spend time with the Father, to spend time with God, to put his eyes on God. He is just starting his ministry. He hasn't even preached yet. He hasn't even preached his first sermon yet. He's just going into the ministry and this is what he's going to do. This is what the Holy Spirit is going to lead him to do before he ever starts his ministry. It's to spend time with the Father, spend time with God, put his eyes on God. So the Holy Spirit is going to lead him. To, watch this. Jesus was led what direction? Up. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days. He's going to lead him up. This is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, slash, that we're spending time and being trained by God, there's something else on the other side of that coin, and it's the devil, and he's going to tempt you. As God trains you, he's going to tempt you. God trained him for 40 days. At the end of 40 days, Satan tempted him. That's the other side of the coin. So every coin in your pocket has a heads and a tails. Every one of them. It's the same coin. 
as God trains you and teaches you and keeps his eyes on you, he's training you to keep your eyes on him no matter what. As God trains you and teaches you that, what's the other side of that coin? Who else is there? Okay, but what we're interested in is that one side of the coin. If you've got your eyes on the right side of the coin, the back side of it will not matter. Now watch this. This is going to be very important to every Christian. It's not your ministry. It's your Messiah. Told you last week, it's not the boat. It's not the ship. It's your Savior. It's going to be our God that's important to us. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Now let's see how, how God is going to lead him. On your hand, you've got a thumb and four fingers. Okay, here's what I want you to see. The thumb is, just, is the Holy Spirit of God. Just hold your hand up and wiggle your thumb. That's going to be the Holy Spirit of God, and it's going to work with all four other fingers. One, two, three, four. He was in prayer to the Father fasting. But the only reason you fast is so you can pray. So he's, the Spirit is going to be working with prayer. Jesus is going to be praying and the Holy Spirit is going to be working with that. He's where? Where did the Spirit lead him? Into the wilderness. And the, the other translation of that is aloneness into solitary. He's alone. He's going to be in the wilderness alone. That's your second finger. How many days is he going to spend there? It doesn't matter how many days. We've got to spend some time with God. That's your third finger. Time. And then when Satan comes, what does Jesus always do when Satan tempts him? Jesus says, it is written. It is written. It is written. That's the word of God. That's your fourth finger. Now here's how God is going to lead us and here's how God is going to keep our eyes on him. Number one, prayer. The Holy Spirit of God is going to lead you and he's going to lead you up. And the first thing he's going to use to lead you is prayer. Jesus was fasting and praying. The second thing he's going to use is you're aloneness. You need to get alone with God. There needs to be a time when you're alone with God. Jesus was always trying to get alone with God, was he not? After he fed 5,000 people, he sends his disciples off. Where does he go? Up on the mountain, alone with God. He's always trying to get alone with God. Here he's trying to be alone with God. We need some alone time with our God. Just me and him. That's what the Spirit uses. Alone time with God. 40 days, 40 nights, that's time. You can spend time with God and have other people around you, but you need to spend time with God and be alone sometimes. So there's aloneness, and then there is time with God, and it's important however much time you're going to spend, however much time you've got, but it's important that we have time with God, and the Spirit of God is going to use that time with God. And then lastly, Jesus is quoting Scripture because he's been meditating those 40 days and 40 nights, and the Holy Spirit uses what? The last one. The Word of God. The Scripture. We've got to do this. That is how we're going to have our eyes on God. How are we going to have our eyes and how are we going to keep our eyes on God? Those four ways right there, working with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working with us. You cannot see the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about this is God took the Israelites and he led them through the wilderness with a cloud. You could see the cloud. Then he's going to change that after 40 years. And he's going to lead them with the Ark of the Covenant. It's not as big as the cloud, but you could see the four priests and the Ark of the Covenant. But at Pentecost, he's going to change that. Now he's going to lead them with the Holy Spirit of God invisible. Oh, that's a big step. Now I'm going to follow God and 
the Spirit is going to lead me, and God tells me, Jesus tells me, I want you to follow me, I want, but I can't see him. Okay, so everybody stand up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> everybody stand up and close your eyes. I'm just kidding. And then I want you to walk around for a little bit and just figure out where you are. How's that going to work for you? But if I have you stand up and hold on to somebody's hand whose eyes are open, although yours are closed and you can't see them, but his eyes are open or her eyes are open, I'm going to have you follow them around and they're going to talk to you and lead you and tell you exactly where to go. How's that going to work for you? Much, much, much better. And that's where God is leading us today. We cannot see him. So we're going to have to have quite a bit of faith. As we follow him. This is going to be very important. We're going to have to be able to follow Christ without seeing him. And we're going to have to let the Holy Spirit of God lead us up without seeing him. And so the, he's going to use four things to do it. He's going to work with the word of God. He's going to work with prayer. He's going to work with some quiet time with God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. And in this society, that's difficult. Be still and know that I'm God. And then we're going to have to have some time. We're going to have to cut him some time out of our schedule and give him some time. And those four things are going to be how God leads us and directs us and guides us. Now, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. And we always think, okay, he was physically hungry. And yes, he was. That's not just what that's talking about. When you study that word, it means to thirst or hunger after something. He'd been spending time with God for 40 days and 40 nights and he wanted more. He wanted to go deeper with God. He wanted to know how to pray better with God. He wanted more scripture with God. He wanted more of God. Now, he's hungry physically. Yes, he is. But this is much more than that. He wants to be with God more. And he hungered. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God... Okay, this is going to bring us to point number two, and then we're going to come back and talk about some of this stuff. Point number two, eyes on everything else except God. This is the temptation. Eyes on everything else except God. Several kinds of temptations. There's three main temptations, but every one of them takes your eyes off of God. This is putting your eyes on anything, everything else, anything else. But God, because Jesus is what's important. We're going to see how, how difficult this becomes in just a moment. If you're the son of God, what did he just do? Prove it. He just put his eyes on him. He tried to put his eyes on him. Prove that you're God. He just took his eyes off the Father and put them on him, did he not? Or he tried to. If you're the son of God... If you, would you underline you? If you, if you, if you. Command these stones to become bread. Let's keep reading for just a moment. Verse 5, the devil took him up into the holy city. Verse 8, again, the devil took him up to exceed the high mountain. Okay, now you're going to have to understand this Greek language. It, King James says he took you. The devil took him up. That's not what the Greek says. Now, hang on just a minute because I'm not against the King James or the New King James. I think they're wonderful translations. In fact, I think they're the best translations. But you just can't beat the original language, especially for English because English isn't very... Exact. This doesn't say the, the devil took him up. 
Steve, come here just a minute. Just stand here. You don't have to do nothing, but just stand here. Just, just nothing. This is how the temptation works. You don't have to do nothing. Turn around, face that group. This is how the temptation is going to work, and this is what the, the Greek language says. It says the devil grabbed a hold of him beside him and pulled, tried to pull him away from God. It is the word paralambano. Para means to be beside. Lambano means to grab hold of or seize or pull. What the devil did, here's, here's Steve over here. Go, Steve, with Jesus, walking with Jesus. He's God's man. Walking with Christ, and the devil comes up beside him and grabs a hold of him and pulls. Wow, that's good. Pull! <laughs> and he didn't move. But the wording in the Greek is that the devil came beside him and pulled, tried to pull him away from God. Now, okay, thank you. Give him a hand. We could not pull him away from God. Now, what did the devil use to try to pull Jesus away from God? Number one, miracles. Now watch this. This becomes amazingly subtle. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that the devil, the serpent, was more subtle than anybody else on earth. King James says it this way, he's more subtle than any beast of the field. The devil is very subtle in how he tries to pull us away from God. And here's the first thing he uses in verse 3. Let's do miracles. One of the things that's going to pull us, so there's three things that he's going to use to try to pull Jesus away from God the Father. The first one is miracles. We're going to do miracles. Now, we're not going to let God do the miracles. We're going to do miracles. We're going to heal him. We're going to bring him to church and we're going to heal him. We're going to do the miracles. He said, you, you turn these stones into bread. Not God the Father. You, you do it. This is a spiritual experience. We're going to do miracles. Nobody does a miracle but God. This stuff you're watching on TV where they're doing miracles everywhere, nobody does a miracle but God. If it takes your eyes off Jesus Christ, it's a temptation. All right, now let's keep going for just a minute. We're going to talk about religion. Then the devil took him up into the holy city. Where did he take him? Not just into the city. Take him into the holy city. That's interesting. Holiness does not lead you to Christ. Christ leads you to holiness. And we've got a branch of our Christianity today that's trying to get to Christ through holiness. All that does is take your eyes off Christ and waste your time. You are never going to be perfectly holy. Now, it's okay to be holy, but the way you get holy is not through your own efforts, but it's only through the Holy Spirit. So when we look for Christ, we keep our eyes on Christ, we become holy. Listen, we're being tricked in the way we're being taught. We're being tricked in our seminaries. We're being tricked on TV. We're being tricked in some of the sermons. You can never be holy by yourself. And you can't get more holy to come to God. We're not holy except that the Holy Spirit lives in you. If you want to be more holy, get closer to God. Here's Satan trying to trick Jesus, trying to get his eyes off of Christ. He took him to the holy city. He took him to Jerusalem. Have you been to Jerusalem lately? David has. <laughs> there wasn't anything real holy about Jerusalem. There's nothing real holy about Israel. It's another country, and it's where Christ grew up. Yes, it is. Christ is what made Israel holy. Not Israel didn't make Christ holy, and Israel will not make you holy. And it, it takes our eyes off of Christ. 
The devil took him to the holy city and set him where? Where did he set him? Set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Took him to the temple. And he said it this way. Jump. The angels will catch you. Now we're getting way too involved in angelology in this time period. It's not about the angels. It's about Jesus. Angels are real. There's good angels, there's bad angels. There's the devil who was a created angel. He's a fallen angel. And there's good angels who stayed with God. And there are angels, good and bad, and they're all over the place. And they are your servants. But we do not keep our eyes on angels. It's not about angels. And it's not about miracles. It's about Jesus Christ and him only. He takes him up there and he says, why don't you jump off? Why don't you show them your power? Why don't you reveal your power to them so that they will know that you're the Messiah? This is a way around the cross. You don't have to die. Just reveal yourself. Just jump off the pinnacle and everybody will know that you are God. The angels will catch you. Well, so Satan tempts him with miracles. Satan tempts him with religion. Remember, it's very subtle. Religion. Satan tempts him with religion. I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to ask you a question. I've still got a couple of minutes. Where in the world, according to Scripture, at the time of Jesus, were most of the demons in the world? They were in Israel. Where was Satan... At the time of Jesus, where was Satan in the world? He was in Israel. Who do you think demon-possessed Judas? It says Satan did. Where was he? He was in Israel. Where were most of the demons at that time? They were in Israel. Why were they all in Israel? And how come there were so many demon-possessed people in the synagogues and the church of Israel? Because when you have religion without Christ, you've got Satan. You can't have religion and not have Christ or you're going to have Satan. This is the subtlety of, of Satan. We must keep our eyes on Christ. It's all about Christ and him and him alone. If you've got religion and you're not following Christ, you're in terrible trouble. We don't find Christ through holiness. We find holiness through Christ. Lastly, the last temptation is verse 8. He took him up on a high mountain. The devil took him up. He grabbed hold of him, tried to pull him away from God, took him up on a high mountain, exceedingly high, showed him all the kings of the world and all their glory. Let me tell you what the, the glory of the kings were. Gold, silver, glory, power, fame, fortune. And he said, look at all of that. I'll give it to you. Now, could Satan really give it to him? Yes, he could. I'll tell you why. Because Adam gave it to Satan. Satan. God gave it to Adam. Adam gave it to Satan. He betrayed God and gave it away. Satan could give it to him. Now, here's the, here's the issue. What's the Bible calling Satan right here? What's the word it uses for him? The devil. You know what the word devil means? Accuser. So right after he gives Jesus all this stuff, he's going to come to the Father and say, Jesus sinned. Jesus betrayed you. He's the accuser. So the guy that's giving it to him is the guy that's going to destroy him. Oh, he's a dirty liar. And he offers us all this stuff and it gets our eyes off God. And here's how Jesus kept referring to it. It is written. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, it's written again. 
Satan takes the scripture in verse 6 and quotes Jesus' scripture and says, that the angel, you jump off the temple and the angels will guard you. And Jesus says to him in verse 7, it's written again. In other words, there's another passage. That's not the end of the story. He didn't give him the whole scripture. It's written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So he just gave part of the scripture and Satan uses part of the scripture. Man, if you want a red Corvette, the Bible says you can ask anything from God and he'll give it to you. It says that if you ask anything from God, he'll give it to you. But the rest of that passage is, if it's his will, and you've got to have all of it, you've got to know the scripture. In other words, you've got to have your eyes on Christ. What's the Bible all about? What's the Bible all about? Jesus said, if you read the Bible and you don't get Jesus every time you read it, you've missed it. All right, now we're going to come back here in verse 10. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Him only, him only, underline it, him only shall you serve. You shall not serve anybody else or anything else, him only. Then the devil left him and the old angels came and ministered to him. Turn with me one passage. Well, I'll tell you what, don't turn with me. Just put Luke up on the screen, would you? Luke chapter 4, this is the same story. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 14, after the temptations are over, look at Jesus. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now, what is Satan offering Jesus? Power. What does God give Jesus? After he comes back from the temptation, you know what Jesus had to do? He had to wait upon the Lord and let the Lord give it to him when he was ready. And he did. And Jesus comes back in power. As the Spirit leads you, the Spirit knows what's good for you and the Spirit knows the timing that's good for you and how much of it you can handle at that time and that's what he gives you until you're ready. Now, I'm going to stop but I want, to, I want to tie all this together. And I want you to remember this. This is not a deep sermon. We could go really deep on the temptations, but that's not what God's trying to do. What Satan is trying to do is grab a hold of his arm and pull him away from God. And what Jesus always does is keeps his eyes on the Father. Now, According to Hebrews 2.18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. So if we see what Jesus does in his temptation, that's what we do. Here's what Jesus did. It's not about the temptations. You can say the temptation, you can figure out how, how Satan works. And there's three main ones. Lust the eyes, lust the flesh, and the pride of life. But that's not what this is about. This is about keeping our eyes on Christ. It's Him. It's the Son of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And He fasted and prayed to the Father God. This is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's all about Him. It's not about holy, it's about him. And if you are walking and filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be holy, you will be more holy, you will be most holy, depending on what kind of relationship you've got with him. But it's about Jesus, it's about the Spirit, it's about God the Father. And it's all about him. It's just him. It's just your relationship with him. How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior and God? That's what it's about. That's what's going to get you to heaven. That's what's going to hold you in eternity. Who lives in your heart? Him. Who's going to take you to heaven? And you're going to spend all the rest of your eternity with Him. This is not about how holy we can be. This is not about how righteous we are. This is, oh, I hate those Pharisees and so did Jesus. Because they taught that you went to heaven by being holy. 
Jesus said, you can't go to heaven unless you're more holy than the Pharisees. And everybody went, Ooh, wow, I can never do that. Don't let him trick you. Don't let Satan trick you that you are not powerful in your prayers. You are very powerful in your prayers. Don't let him trick you that you're not worthy to pray. You're not worthy to come to church. You're not worthy to read the Bible. You're not worthy to even try. Don't let him trick you into that because it's all about you and Jesus. You are the family of God. You are the sons and the daughters of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. It's not about any of that. It's about him. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. It's about him. If you want joy in your life, if you want peace in your life, if you want security in your life, then stay close to him. Put your eyes on him. Read the scriptures for him. Pray to him. Sing to him. We don't sing in this church because we all have good voices. All of you sing better than me, but I sing the loudest. We sing to him. We don't come to church for the art. We don't come to church for the beauty of the music. We come to sing and pray and worship him. We don't come because the pastors are great speakers. Because <laughs> we're not. But we talk about him. We point you to him. We teach the word of God about him. Everything's important about him. He loves you. He holds you. He forgives you. And don't let Satan come to you and say you're not worthy. Don't let Satan cover you up with guilt and say you're not worthy. God's already forgiven you. We belong to Say it with me, him. The son of God came down to earth and lived a perfect life so that I could go to heaven. The son of God forgave me of my sins and no one else can bring anything against me because I have been forgiven by the son of God who died for me. It's all about him. When you leave today, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always and again i say rejoice we don't say rejoice we say rejoice in the lord it's all about him you have been saved 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 now i'm going to quit you are greatly loved the father loves you the son loves you the holy spirit loves you i listened to a pastor today or not today this week who I greatly admire. His theology is just a touch off. He was a five point Calvinist, but he is a very humble, godly, Bible preaching man. And his one of his last messages I listened to was this. Listen to this. He was reading a passage and it says, In hell there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he said, The weepers are the ones that wanted to go to heaven, but didn't get to and they're down there weeping the gnashing of teeth are the ones who didn't want to go to heaven and they're angry at God and of course that's not right but then here's what he said I hope he's been preaching all his life he said I hope I get to go to heaven I want to go to heaven but if I don't get to I'm going to be one of the weepers No! God loves you. The Father loves you. The Son loves you and died for you and resurrected for you and the Holy Spirit loves you and lives inside of you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice and go out and live your lives. Bow with me, please. Thank you, Father, for saving us. Thank you for giving us salvation we can never lose. Thank you for living inside of us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for the power that you've given us through prayer. God, teach us to pray. 
Help us to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face. God, would you bless this church and bless these families and fill them with joy and peace, love and comfort. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.